Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This is the third and final video on historical linguistics, and in this video I'd like to discuss a few changes that happened between Middle English and the subsequent periods of English. Just to recall, in this class we're distinguishing five different periods of English, Old English or Anglo-Saxon, then Middle English, Early Modern English, Late Modern English, and Present Day English. In the last video, I discussed several morphological and syntactic characteristics of Old English and Middle English. So it's time for us to get back into sound change, and that's what we're going to do in this video. Now, um, specifically, I will discuss a very important sound change that happened between Middle English and Early Modern English, namely the Great Vowel Shift. Apart from that, I'll have something to say about minor changes that happened during early modern, late modern, and even present day English. So without further ado, let's move on from Middle English onward and let's discuss the Great Vowel Shift. What's the Great Vowel Shift? Well, I guess I could just explain this to you, but I thought it would be more fun if we would listen to a bit of Middle English so that you can discover for yourself what the Great Vowel Shift was all about. Now, <clears throat> so here's a bit of Middle English that I would like us to listen to. And in addition, I would like you to get out a piece of paper and a pen and to make notes of words that you recognize. Words that you recognize, but that differ in their pronunciation when you compare the Middle English pronunciation to the present day English pronunciation. Yeah? You ready to do that? Then let's have a listen. Okay, very good. Now, I'm sure that you recognized a bunch of words in this text, and I'm willing to guess that April is one of them. Yeah? Let me play this to you. April. April. Here, a long A corresponds to what comes out in modern English as April. Yeah? April. April. So that's a pronunciation difference. And in the following, I would like us to collect pronunciation differences just like this one and I'd like us to enter the differences into a vowel chart such as this one. So take a piece of paper, draw a vowel chart, you recognize this from your phonetics phonology class and uh, you know it doesn't have to be fancy, four corners, that's enough. Um, and then you enter the pronunciation of the Middle English words. Yeah? So April will be down here in the lower middle of the graph. Yeah. Corresponds to modern English April, somewhere here. Right, so what we can do with this kind of exercise is that we examine the sound correspondences between Middle English and modern English in a more systematic way and if we were just to look at individual words and see how they correspond across the two periods of English. Now, let's collect a few more words. There's still a lot of blank spaces in this vowel chart. Um, another word that we can enter is the word shuris. 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 Uh -huh. So here we have a long u in the Middle English pronunciation, and in modern English, we actually have a diphthong. Ow, showers. Shures, showers. Let's enter shures into the vowel chart. Here's where it belongs. It's a high back vowel, u. Moving right along, this word here is a little more difficult to recognize. Persed. 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 What does it mean? Well, uh, you maybe now recognize the modern English word 
pierced. Yeah, you, you poke something, you skewer it. Uh, piercing. Yeah. Oh, you know what a piercing is, don't you? Yeah. Um, right. So that's pierced along e in Middle English, and then along e in Modern English. Let's enter this into the vowel chart. Here we have the position for pierced, and uh, in Modern English that would correspond to a high front e. Yeah. E. Pear said pierced. Here's another easy one. Uh, rote. 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 Yeah. Um, most descriptions of Middle English would characterize this as a back vowel that is high mid. Yeah. Rote. And that corresponds to modern English root. <clears throat> if we enter that into the vowel chart, rote is at the same level as per said, it's just in the back of the vowel chart. Rote, that pronunciation corresponds to the modern English word root, so the u would be up here somewhere. Next one, uh, in spirit, there the, uh, the spelling is just the same as in modern English. Let me play this to you. In spirit, in spirit hath, in every halt and hath. Yeah, so a long E, high front vowel, corresponds to a modern English diphthong I. Let's enter this into the vowel chart. Here we have the Middle English inspired, and it corresponds to a modern English diphthong I. Right, we just have two more slots to fill down here, and the word that belongs here is the word open. Open? Yeah, sounds almost like the modern word open. Um, again, most descriptions of Middle English would have this um, be a open, yeah, more more open vowel um, that it has this position in the vowel chart. Yeah, it's open at the back, lower mid vowel. So um, that means we have one more blank space to fill, and I'm afraid there is no word in the text that would fit the bill. I provide one myself, um, namely the word bräken. Yeah, you have to take that on faith. That's how it's pronounced, bräken. What does it mean? You can probably guess that. It means break. So um, the Middle English ä eh corresponds to a a eh sound in Modern English, break. Right, so there we have it. That is the Middle English system of long vowels, e, 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 a, o, o, and u, and that corresponds to a number of different sounds in present day English. So what I would like you to do now is to pause the video and draw little arrows into the vowel chart um, that mark up the correspondences between the Middle English sounds and the Modern English sounds. Okay, you want to do that? Um, you can press pause and I'll continue now. <clears throat> so, um, the punchline of this little exercise really is that the sound changes that went on in the Great Vowel Shift are very, very systematic. It's not as though every vowel takes their own trajectory and moves somewhere across the vowel chart, but rather all of this hangs together. And in order to show you how this hangs together, how this is very systematic, let me make this big. So let's start by looking at the long high vowels, E and U. Um, now you notice that in spirit turn into a diphthong inspired and the u in shures turn into a, a diphthong also, yeah, showers. So you might say that uh, the long high vowels, they left the vowel chart and turned into diphthongs. And this left these upper places here empty, creating something of a gap or a vacuum or you know, a big nothingness, black holeish type of thing at the top of the vowel chart. And that, of course, can't be, yeah? So these vowels here, the next ones, uh, pierced and rote, they moved up 
and turned into pierced and root, taking up these high vowel places. Now, of course, this middle part of the vowel chart looks awfully empty, and that's how Brecken and Open moved up to become Break and Open. So, everybody just seems to move up and out. Only little April is left down here. So you can imagine, if you were Middle English April, what would you do? Well, I can tell you what I would do. You know, I would feel awfully lonely down there. I would move up and uh, join Brecken. Yeah, so April and break, you notice that is exactly the same sound. So, here we have it. And uh, if you <clears throat> visualize this in a bit more orderly fashion, you know, more statically, then this is what happens. Um, the long high vowels move out to become diphthongs, and everybody below that just moves up either one level, ah, uh, yeah, goes a bit overboard, you know, goes all the way to a. E. So there's a merger of Brecken to break and April to April. That's it. Um, you see, it's beautifully systematic. It's been described as a so-called chain shift because the vowels move just like the elements in a chain. If you pull one, all the rest will follow. But I hasten to add that we do not really know whether um, the change happened in the way that I just described to you as a pull chain, so that the high vowels moved first and dragged everybody else behind them. It could as well have been a pull chain, so that maybe April moved first, or Brecken moved first, uh, creating a very, very crowded space, which made it hard for speakers to differentiate between the vowels, so that the vowels moved up. Yeah, push chain or pull chain, that we don't really know. If you want to make a name for yourself in historical English linguistics, it might be just the thing for you. Right. In summary, then, the Great Vowel Shift, when did it happen? Well, a good enough guess for the starting date is the year 1400, yeah, just before the beginning of early modern English. Um, when does it end? Well, sometime during early modern, maybe 1600. It was a major sound change that differentiates modern English from Middle English. It affected all Middle English long vowels, yeah, not the short vowels, not the consonants. And uh, it's interesting because it accounts for the inconsistent spellings that characterize present-day English. Well, many of these inconsistent spellings. Why do you spell goose with two O's? Yeah, well, it's a great vowel shift. Now you know. Is it a push chain or a pull chain? Well, that remains for future research. Okay, now with all this in mind, I would like to turn to a few words that maybe are a little problematic when we look at the great vowel shift. Um, here's one of these words, drucht. Let me play this to you. Drucht. Drucht, yeah. And this corresponds to the modern English word drought, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, if we look back, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, you notice that drought, words with an L, they should really correspond to Middle English words that have a long U, expecting us, something, uh, leading us to expect something like drought. Yeah, but that's not what we hear. We hear drought, drought. Okay, let's look at another word, namely nicht. Nicht. That's sleep and all the nicht. 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 Yeah. Um, again, the modern English word is night. So, modern English I corresponds to Middle English E. We would have expected something like need, but here the pronunciation seems to be nicht. Why is that? Well, the answer lies in this little symbol X here. Um, that's a fricative. <clears throat> that is pronounced ch in nicht and ch in drucht. Yeah? And, um, well, how does this lead to night in the end? Well, the key to the story is the loss of this fricative element. 
um, which then led to what's called compensatory lengthening. So one element was lost, the fricative, but uh, to compensate for that, the vowel in these words was lengthened. So nicht first turned into neat in late Middle English, which made it uh, available for the great, great vowel shift, which then turned it into night. Same with drucht, was first turned into drut and then into drought. So, <clears throat> right. Another little complexity here is that some Middle English dialects didn't lose the sh sound, but rather turned it into something different, such as an f. This accounts for the modern English word laugh. Yeah, so this goes back to a Middle English word lauchen. Some uh, dialects lost the fricatives, others turned it into an f, and this is what gave us the modern English word laugh. <coughs> okay, let's talk about some changes during modern English. What happened after all of this? Well, there are two important vowel changes that concern short vowels, um, concerning both short u and short a. Uh, words with a short u were turned into words with a short a. So instead of but, we have but. Uh, but. Instead of butter, we have butter. Instead of cup, we have uh, cup. Short a lengthens to a and then lowers to a, giving us half, bath, laugh, and castle, at least in certain dialects. So one important qualification that I need to make here is that these changes didn't happen uh, in the same way in all dialects. Let look, let's look at two dialect maps of England here. You see that this um, <clears throat> vowel that we find in son, bus, mother, butter, and so on and so forth, it is an a in most areas of the south, but it was retained as an u in most of the north. So there people say sun, bus, mother, butter, and so on and so forth. Um, also with regard to the short a, we can actually see the different stages of this change in different dialect areas of England. So we have it as a short a in much of the north, yeah, last path we have it as a long a in uh, much of the south, last dance path, and we have it lowered as last dance or path in these areas of the south here. So <clears throat> let's talk about some consonant changes. Um, some consonants were lost in complex onsets, that is, at the beginning of a word when there were other consonants around. Uh, for example, k and g were lost before nasals at the beginning of words. Um, so when you read the word nat, you don't say gnat, you say nat. Knee is knee and not knee. Gnome is gnome and not gnome. Um, likewise, there were consonant losses at the end of words. For instance, in climb, you write a B at the end of the word, but you don't pronounce it. Lamb, the same thing, you don't pronounce the B. Uh, in tongue, the G sort of survives as a shade of the nasal. Yeah, it's a velar nasal that you pronounce there, but the velar stop is gone. Then uh, another complex onset, the VR onset, yeah, VRATH, <clears throat> um, was simplified to just R. So it's right, wrong, wrath. <clears throat> more consonant changes. Post-vocalic R. I'll have more to say about post-vocalic R in a few videos' time when we talk about sociolinguistics. That was lost in British English. So we have arm, car, horse, not arm, car, and horse. Uh, post-vocalic L was lost before velar consonants. So we have walk and folk uh, without the L being pronounced there. <clears throat> I want to also mention a few morphological changes because it's not just sound changes that go on. Um, the loss of morphological endings that characterized much of the development 
from Old English to Middle English to a certain extent continues into late and uh, early and late modern. Uh, for instance, the second person ending, um, thou givest, that disappears. So in present day English, we just have you give and not thou givest. <clears throat> the third person ending uh, in the third, yeah, the, the third person ending th uh, just changes to s, he giveth. Um, well, <clears throat> all that is left in present day English is he gives and there are certain changes in pronouns so the thou pronoun that gives way to ye and you. <clears throat> um, two important syntactic changes uh, perhaps the most important syntactic change um, going on towards present day English is the rise of do support that we have in negation and question formation. So in early modern English you could say he heard not that. Yeah. In present day English in order to negate a sentence you have to have what's called do support. The use of the auxiliary do you say he did not hear that. Um, similar thing at work in questions. In early modern English you could ask what says he to my little jewel. In present day English you would say what does he say to my little jewel. That is called do support. <clears throat> also we have things going on with the auxiliary of the past in uh, present-day English it's just have be in a very very few cases um, so in early modern English you would have things like time was not come yeah in present-day English you say the time had not come if you speak a language that has be and have alternations in the perfect you know all about this English in a way gives you a free ride here because uh, be is no longer an option in most cases. So my last slide here I want to mention at least some current changes that go on. Um, one thing that keeps on going on is the loss of irregular verbal morphology. So verbs tend to regularize over time. They even have something of a half-life. Um, so the more frequent irregular verbs, they linger for a longer time than less frequent irregular verbs. So an irregular past tense form like dreamt turns into dreamed. <clears throat> also, the morphological comparison, as in politer or politest with the superlative, is on the retreat giving way to the analytic forms more polite or most polite. Uh, there's the S genitive, that's a really interesting story, um, spreading to non-human nouns, non-human possessors. So instead of the cover of the book, we can now say the book's cover or uh, the company's um, governing board, something like that. So non-human possessors were not that acceptable during earlier stages of English as far as the S genitive was concerned. Um, the auxiliary shall, you know, if you are younger than me, you probably never use it. I use it rarely. And um, instead of shall, we have things like will and specifically be going to, which is on the rise. Um, do support continues its uh, spread. There were certain constructions that were sort of exempt from do support, like we haven't much time. Um, well, here, do support has gone the whole hog, so now people say we don't have much time. And lastly, there are funny things like the spread of singular there. Uh, I could ask you, has everyone, everybody got their hand out when I really want to ask, has everyone got his or her, her or his hand out? All right, so these are some of the changes that go on in present day English. There's more to say about this, but I'd really like to close here and I hopefully see you next time.